All right, Crossroads, you guys ready to dive in? Are we ready to do this today? Yeah. Everybody has an extra hour of sleep, so there should be no sleeping during the sermon today. Uh, I would vote immediately for an extra hour of sleep every Saturday night. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't care if six months from now we're in the middle of the night walking through the, an extra hour of sleep. Every said would be great by me. Uh, I feel like we need to give a special welcome to our St. Pete campus today. This is the first time they've had internet since the hurricane came through, and they're, they're joining us. Good morning, St. Pete. And a special shout out to our Nashville campus. This is a big day, launching a big service. Let's give it up for our Nashville crowd. We love you guys. We're so excited for you. And as always, our Mishawaka campus. Let's give it up for Mishawaka, because there's a lot of amazing things happening in Mishawaka. Uh, We are all over the place, and I'm excited about what God is doing at Crossroads and within our church family. And as we dive in today, I want to start with something extra special for unnecessary censorship, something that we don't talk about that we should. And are you guys ready for this? It's, it's not, it really wasn't part of the notes. We're going off script. Is that scary or is that fun? I don't know where we stand, but, but here we go. Uh, it's, fu- it's fun until I start talking about it. <laughs> And then it's no longer fun. Uh, I think I want to start like this. Uh, I was with uh, some guys at our men's breakfast yesterday. Give it up for our men. Men's breakfast. Yeah, let's go. Yes. All right. Uh, I was sharing with them something I discovered this week from a friend of mine. Uh, They did a new study on the next generation for attention span. Uh, and, And they were just curious to see how short our attention span has gotten because of social media, the internet, just everything at our disposal. You need to do different things all the time. And it used to be in, in the olden days uh, that the attention span was about eight minutes. And in old, olden days, when you're watching TV, there'd be a commercial break like every eight minutes to kind of reset, and then you get your focus back. Well, over time, that has gotten significantly shorter and shorter and shorter until now. I mean, everybody's on social media. I mean, you're going through reels and video clips. And honestly, if you don't like excite me or impress me in the first few seconds, you just flip through the net, right? It's like short attention span. Well, how has that affected the next generation? Well, comparatively, I need to say something else first. Would anyone like to guess what the average uh, focus and attention span for a goldfish is? Let's just start there. It's, it's nine seconds, nine seconds. I, I don't even know how they, how did you figure that out? I have no idea. I did. I mean, tell me how you feel about that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how they did that, but They say the average attention span for goldfish is nine seconds. In the new study for the next generation, the average attention span for the next generation is eight seconds. Eight seconds less than a goldfish. That's where we are at as a culture. Less than a goldfish. It's like, oh my goodness. To keep someone's attention, it's got to be like repetitive over and over again. Like it's, it's a, it's a constant thing. And, and I think about that in terms of our relationship with God. And I think about, oh my goodness, we've, we've got to circle this because this matters. Because when you are focusing on something that has eternal significance, and that's what we're talking about today, we're talking about my destiny, eternity. When we're talking about focusing on things that truly matter, if our attention span that's kind of become hardwired into us is getting that short, like eight seconds, we've got to really be intentional about making sure we stay focused on the things that really matter, right? I, I can't allow myself to get distracted, I can't allow myself to to miss out on really amazing things that God created me for because I got distracted by something that is temporary and has no value whatsoever. So what I focus on, it really, really matters. And what I want to circle out of the gate today is a concept out of Philippians 3. And this is not in the notes, so just bear with me. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul specifically lays out what he focuses on. He's saying, these are the things, this is the one thing that I actually focus on. And he said, I have my eyes on this heavenly race that God is calling me to. I have my eyes on this heavenly prize that I am going to receive in in heaven. It is a heavenly prize. And I want to circle that because that is what Paul was focused on. And Paul is significant. He wrote about half of the New Testament. So let's, let's think about that for a second. Paul His focus is always on things that are eternal. He is focused on the prize that awaits him when when he takes his last breath and he stands before God. He is focusing everything in his life on the heavenly prize. And because of that, he, he challenges everybody to forget what is behind, 
Look to what is ahead and chase after what God has for you. And then he makes this comparison. He said, if, if you look around and you see people who are focusing on all these wrong things, the things that are temporary, and by their actions, they've been distracted. They've allowed things that are evil and shameful to overtake their lives. You can see they're not chasing after this heavenly prize. And then the challenge is found in Philippians 3.20. And I just want to read this to you. He, he circles this. He says, if I'm focusing on this heavenly prize, this race that God is calling me to, this is what he says in Philippians 3.20. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our savior. I love that. It, it, it recaptures and repositions everything about our journey because I'm thinking about life through the perspective of this idea that I am a citizen of heaven. I am part of the kingdom of God. And that is the most important thing. Is anybody here grateful that you are part of the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus has claimed you, that you are forgiven, that you are free? Uh, when you talk about the idea that you are a citizen of heaven, can we just be clear on this and not miss this? If, if I am a citizen of heaven, if I have put my trust in Jesus, and I believe that he is who he says he is, that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that my eternal destiny is shaped by who he is, what I do with Jesus, and what I do with the gifts that he gave me, then the reality is there is nothing more important than my life than chasing after what it means to be a citizen of heaven. Everything in my life needs to overflow and pour out of that fact, that reality. I am a child of God. I am part of the kingdom of heaven, and I want to focus on those things and not be distracted by the other things. So keeping all of that in mind, we are citizens of heaven. Let's talk politics for a second. <laughs> Oh, see, you were so much more excited about going off script. <laughs> now you're not. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I promise this won't be painful. Uh, let's talk politics. Number one, uh, we have election day on Tuesday. Uh, many of you have already voted. I, I would encourage you, if you can, get out there and vote, because that's, that's your civic duty. But I want to encourage you with four, four things this week. Number one, the fate of the kingdom of God, which you belong to, you are a citizen of heaven, it does not depend on political contests. Can we take a sigh of relief like for a second? Okay, it does not depend on political contests. Listen, we'll wake up Wednesday morning. We may or may not know who won the election because, I mean, let's just be clear, it's chaos every time. But God still sits on the throne, okay? And we put our trust in him. We are citizens of heaven. And number two, this is really important, if your political passion, and, and political passion is fine, it's important, you should vote, these things are important, don't, don't mis misunderstand what I'm saying, but if your political passion makes it difficult for you to love your neighbor as yourself, you need to turn it down a notch, because it's not worth jeopardizing the light that you shine as a citizen of heaven. Because being a citizen of heaven is far more important than being a citizen of the United States. All right, let's just be clear. Number three, here's the thing. This is where it gets personal. Exercise the freedom to vote your conscience and conviction. You need to do that. While accepting the fact that other Christians will do the same and vote differently than you. That one hurts. Like, oh, come on. Is that real? Yes. In this room, people are going to vote differently. It just is what it is. We're not all the same person with the same views that have the same regular, you know, we don't have the same priorities. There are going to be people in this room who vote differently than you. And we have to still be able to love each other, okay? Because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is more important. And finally, I want to just say this. Number four, it is far more important for you to connect people with Jesus than it is to connect them with your political party, all right? Let me, okay, you get it, you get it. I want to say that again so that we don't miss it. It is far, far more important for your life to point people toward Jesus than it is to your political party because Jesus is eternal. Jesus is, is everything. And as a citizen of heaven, I, I want us to stay focused on the main thing. And please, in the middle of the chaos that is election season, make sure that your light shines bright, that you remember who you are. You are a citizen of heaven. Are, can we all agree on that? Are we good? Everybody good? We good? Okay. I'm so glad. Now, now that we've said that, can we just pause and just say a prayer for our nation. Can we do that? Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Jesus, I just want to say thank you for the love that you have for us, for the fact that we are citizens of your kingdom, citizens of heaven, because that changes everything. And yet here, God, as we walk through planet Earth, we recognize that this is a big week in our nation, 
And God, we just ask that you would go before us, that you would bless our leaders, our current leaders and the leaders who will be elected. God, would you just bless them in every way? Would you give them your wisdom and would you guide their steps? God, uh, this is a nation that's been founded on you and your principles. God, may you be glorified and may we turn toward you. God, that's our prayer. And we love you and we thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. That was it. That was the off script stuff. So if you survived that, is everybody still here? Oh, a lot of people left. Okay. Uh, I'm just kidding. We still got everybody. Now let's dive in. Let's take this to the next level because that's all part of the introduction to the topic today. And I was told by Corey, I just want you guys to know here, here at Crossroads, Corey Hepler is in charge of everything production. There were so many slides that I gave him today that were possible ways that this could go that he informed me that I have 36 seconds per slide. That's all I have because there's so many slides. I'm not going to use them all. Just so you guys breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Unless you want me to. I could use all of them and we could be here for a while. Yep. I mean, we are talking about eternity. We might as well just go for it. Uh, The reality is, when I put my trust in Jesus, when I claim my citizenship in heaven, that changes everything. And when I own the truth that it is far more important for me and my life, the way that I live, the light that shines through me, to connect people with Jesus than anything else, we have to circle that and recognize that matters. This is a big deal. I mean, here at Crossroads, when we talk about our mission, like why is it that we do what we do? It is to connect people with God. Why is that our mission? Because we believe that Jesus changes everything. We are part of his kingdom. We are citizens of heaven. And we believe that when we take our last breath on planet Earth, that we're going to be standing in the presence of God, and everything in life is going to depend on what we did with Jesus. And so when we talk about our eternal destiny... When we talk about the future that God has for us, make no mistake, as we, as we walk through this, this series, we've talked about our origin. Where do we come from? Why does that matter? If I believe that I was created by God, that means everything in my life has meaning and purpose. I've been created by him. I've been created for him. That gives me a moral code to live by. That means that my behavior should reflect the fact that I know Jesus. And because I put my trust in God, I believe that I have hope for a future, an eternal destiny with him. I am a citizen of heaven. And that changes everything. And and it all hinges on Jesus. And and so I asked this question out of the gate, why Jesus? Let's just take the next few minutes and talk about this. When it talks about the fact that our eternal destiny hangs on that, I think it's good for us to be able to answer the question, why Jesus? Because he makes some pretty big claims about his authority over heaven and earth. And he presents himself not as one, of, as one possible path to God, but as God himself. Like, he, he goes there. He makes some pretty definitive statements about who he is. And we can choose not to believe him, but he cannot be one truth among many. He has simply not given us that option. And so we have to talk about that. Like, why Jesus? Why does that matter so much? Well, in John 14, 1 through 6, Jesus lays this out for his disciples. And I want to lean into this today because I want to make sure we are all on the same page and understand this because this stuff matters. This impacts our eternal destiny. And in John 14, here's what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. I I love that there's kind of a a pause here. Because after Jesus explains all of this, like I... I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's room in my father's house. Trust me on this. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. And then he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And I think all of his disciples who are gathered around him are tracking what he's saying. They're excited, like, hey, this sounds awesome. We're going to be able to spend time with Jesus. Like, he wants to be with me in a place he's preparing specifically for me. I want to be in this place. And then he drops this bomb, like, you know how to get where I am going. And it's Thomas, the one who we call Doubting Thomas. He has a couple of cameo appearances throughout the Gospels. This is one of his questions. It says, he said to him, 
No, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? I, I love that. Can we just be honest for a second? I think my favorite disciple is Peter because he just is always just randomly, he's, he's acting before he thinks and he gets himself into dumb situations. Does anybody resonate with that? Like you, you maybe if, if you were one of the disciples, you'd probably be Peter. I like honestly, I hate to say this, I hate to admit this about myself, but if I wasn't going to be Peter, I, I would probably end up being Thomas because he's asking all the questions that I would have too. Like Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you and it's going to be amazing and you know how to get to where I'm going. I'd be like, wait a second, no, 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 I do not. How do I get there? Like, I don't want to miss this. It's a valid question, right? Like we always tend to diminish Thomas. That's a good question. Like you want to make sure you've got that answer. You know how to get there. I do do not. I'm still printing out directions on MapQuest. I have no idea where I'm going. <laughs> Jesus told him, and this is such an important verse in, in, in the scriptures, because this changes everything. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That's a huge statement that Jesus makes. No, we don't know how to get there. <laughs> how do we get there? What's the way? Jesus says unequivocally, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is a statement that you can't ignore. You either have to choose to believe this is true about Jesus or, or, or believe that it is not true. Right? What you do with that statement, what you do with Jesus, I believe it ultimately determines your eternal destiny. And I think it was Lee Strobel who came out with this, this idea that you have to decide one of three realities with Jesus. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he's Lord, right? Because in that statement, he's either lying, like this is just a lie that I'm telling you because I want some sort of glory or power. He's either a lunatic, like he's a crazy person because he thinks he's God. Or the other option is he's actually who he says he is. He is Lord, and we all have to decide what it is that we are going to do with Jesus. Because our eternal destiny determines, is determined by it. I want to walk through some key facts about eternity with you. This is what we learn from Scripture, and this is clear. And again, nobody likes to talk about uh, the reality of hell, but we, we like to talk about heaven, right? Like, oh, let's talk about heaven, not hell. But the reality is there, there's two places we see in Scripture where, where people end up for eternity. Everyone will exist eternally either in heaven or hell. That's something that we have to come to grips with. If you believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it gives us everything that we need to know everything about God and to live the life that he's called us to and to, to have relationship with him, then this is the reality that, that awaits all of us. Everyone exists eternally, either in heaven or hell. Number two, your eternal destiny will be determined by what you did with Jesus. So why Jesus? Why is it so important that we talk about this and grapple with this and fully understand this? Because my eternal destiny is determined by what I do with Jesus. Number three, your destiny will be impacted by what you did with the gifts that God gave you. To be clear, what I do with the gifts that God gives me, the good works that I do in my life, those good works do not save me. They cannot save me. Jesus is the one who saves me. But what I do with the gifts that God gives me, we see this throughout scripture, we get eternally, eternally rewarded for what we do with the gifts that God gave us. There, there's some way that it's defined. We don't know what that looks like exactly, but the reality is you will be rewarded for, for how you were obedient and followed Jesus with the gifts that he gave you. I'm not sure if it, it's like a tier one, tier two, tier three, like, oh, you get a little condo uh, on the inner levels. Tier two, you get a condo on the beach side. It's fantastic. Tier three, you're on the golden street. I, I don't know how that works, but the reality is you will be rewarded for what you did with the gifts that God gave you. And there is a beautiful picture uh, in Scripture several times where, where you see that people who stand before God, the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, and where he says, well done, good and faithful service, there is a beautiful picture where everything that we've done while we were on planet Earth is thrown into the, the redeeming fire. It's, it's, it's just this the refining fire. And, and only what was done in our life that had eternal significance survives that fire. And it's like this treasure that is sitting there. And there's this beautiful picture of the people who are standing before the eternal God, our 
creator God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, there's no one like him. In the, in the, in the presence of God, everything that we've done that, that has survived the refiner's fire, this priceless treasure, in that moment, it's just this picture of we give that all to him. Like it's, it's an amazing moment of, of just offering and worship to, to the creator God. I mean, what an amazing moment. And we have this opportunity with this, with this finite amount of time that God has given us to invest in things that have eternal value, that, that truly shape our destiny. And I want to lean into this today because I, I want to make sure we don't avoid this topic. We talk about unnecessary censorship, not talking about these things. Why? I want to make sure that we are investing every possible moment that we can so that when we stand before God and, and we put all of our life in that refiner's fire, that, that the things that I invested my time in actually had significance. They actually mattered. I don't want to fall into the trap of losing focus because I had good intentions, but I just got distracted because I only have eight seconds of attention span now. I want to make sure that I was intentional about being obedient and following Jesus and, and taking my citizenship as a citizen of heaven seriously so that when I stood before Jesus, I know that I put my trust in Jesus. What I did with Jesus, it, it helped me spend eternity with him, and I was obedient. I followed him with the gifts and abilities that he gave me so that when I stand before God, I invested in something that has eternal value, and I can present that to him as my offering. I, that, that's the moment I want everyone to experience. In the presence of God, him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the gates of my kingdom. I mean, that, that's what that's the goal, right? That's the prize, that's the heavenly prize that awaits us. That's what Paul was saying. I want to focus on that. I want my life to be fixated on making sure that that moment is incredible. Our eternal destiny depends on, on what we do with Jesus. And you're going to be impacted by what you did with Jesus and what you did with the gifts that he gave you. And I want to encourage you today. I think we do fall into this trap of being distracted. We, we are, I think we're surrounded by people and, and ingrained in a culture that just distracts us by our busyness. And I'm a firm believer that if the devil can't make you bad, he's going to make you busy. And so I think we're surrounded by things that aren't necessarily evil or bad. The, the things that we have, you know, that are our hurts, our habits, our hangups are not necessarily bad things, but they are distracting us from the better things. They are distracting us from the things that are eternal. And I want to encourage you to just circle that concept and that idea in your life that, man, I don't want you to fall in the trap of making sure that you're not focusing on the right things. When Paul says, I focus on this one thing, I think that matters. I think that's got to be the intentionality and the cry of our heart. I want to focus my life every day when I wake up. I want to make sure that I do something intentionally that is focusing on running this race that God has called me to, to finishing that race well, to keeping my eyes on that heavenly prize that God has for me, and making sure that I take advantage of every opportunity that God presents to me to do everything that I can to invest in that, that eternal reward. But let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the, the perfecter of our faith and, and he bore the, the, the shame and the suffering of the cross so that we could have life. I don't think that we can take that too lightly. We have to take that seriously because Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And if you believe that, that no one comes to the Father but by him, what we do with Jesus matters. I think people, some people probably get a little bit tired of the fact that nearly every Sunday we close with the prayer of saying yes to Jesus, but that's why we do that. You guys, every Sunday is different here at Crossroads. There's always people here for the first time. Typically, there will be someone here for the last time. It's someone who is here for one time. They had a moment of conviction or their mom really laid it on thick and they said, fine, mom, I'll come to church. And, and we had them for that one moment. I, the cry of my heart is that every single person who comes to the doors of Crossroads gets the chance to say yes to Jesus. Because what I do with Jesus determines my eternal destiny. We've got to keep that, that focus our one thing. And so when we talk about our eternal destiny, can we just take a moment to talk about those two options, heaven and hell? Because the beauty of heaven is that in heaven, everything is reimagined. I love what it says in Revelation. It's this picture. In fact, I'm just going to take a moment to read through Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Uh, can we just think about this for a second? I'm going to go through this faster than I want to, but it's important to, to lean into this reality. In heaven, everything is reimagined. All things are new. 
In Revelation 21, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Um, What you see then is that everything is restored. Watch this, and this is so important. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. There is no separation. That relationship that was broken has been completely restored. You are in the presence of God, and you are in an unbroken fellowship with him. It is an amazing situation to be in. And finally, you see that everything is renewed. It continues he's on. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Think about that. Like that, that, is, that is the picture of heaven that we see in scripture. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, I think growing up, we're probably taught about the streets of gold, and it's this amazing place where all of your wildest dreams come true, and it's a place that you can't even imagine. And I truly believe that that's true. But the amazing part of this is that I'm actually in the presence of God. I have an unbroken relationship with him, an intimate relationship with God that that I was created for. Everything that's been broken by sin is gone. There is no more suffering. There is no more sickness. There is no more pain. It's gone forever. That's what God wants to experience with you. He wants to be with you. That is the eternal destiny that that Jesus longs for you to experience. But then it says in verse 8, It says, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I mean, these are two completely different realities. And Jesus talked about hell quite a bit. He talked about the reality of hell more than he talked about the reality of heaven. And I think that's because he wants us to know that this is, this is not the eternal destiny he wants for us. Because the story he tells of the rich man and Lazarus that you can see in the Gospels is that there is a conscious torment that comes not from you know, just you know, the eternal flame that we read about, that picture of hell, but it's, it's the conscious torment of being able to remember every opportunity that you had while you were alive to actually say yes to Jesus and and to follow him. I mean, there's this conscious torment of of regret and this this continued separation from who God is because the reality of hell is that that you continue to live in that broken relationship, separated eternally from from the all-powerful, all-loving God. And I think that the thing that we struggle with is is the idea of, well, why, why does hell even exist then? If God loves us so much, why does he send people to hell? And the reality is we have to think about that from the other side of things. It, it's why do we not say yes to Jesus? It's not that why would God, a loving God send people to hell. Why do we not say yes to the gift that he has given us? God has done everything he can to restore the relationship that we broke. You recognize that when we sinned, we broke that relationship with God that he longs to have with us? Do you understand that Jesus stepped out of heaven, became a man, and died on the cross so that we could be set free and be be forgiven and experience this eternal destiny that he longs for us to have? He has done everything to make himself available and to give us this gift that we do not deserve. And all we have to do is, is receive that gift. And it sounds simple, like I received that gift, easy, I, we did it, yay, I said the prayer, but that's just the beginning. Because then it's the life that Jesus calls us to. If, if you recognize what God has done for you, you cannot be unchanged. The goal is to become more like him and to follow him and to deny myself and take up my cross daily and, and follow him. Focus on him and who he is and who he's calling me to be. And I just want to challenge you today, man. When you, if you grapple with that, that concept of hell, the reason for hell is my rejection of Jesus. It's, it's my sin that separates me from God. A loving God, people say, would not send people to a horrible hell. No, he has done everything to offer us eternal life. The reality is we send ourselves to hell by rejecting him. Jesus said, 
I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but, my, but by me. What we're talking about is so important today. Why Jesus? Because Jesus changes everything. And when I receive him into my life, you guys, that's when we become citizens of heaven. And when Paul says, this is the one thing I focus on. I'm running this race. I'm, I'm going to give everything I have to, to reach this heavenly prize that God has called me to. I just want to challenge you today. Make that the one focus of your life to run this race in such a way that you win this prize that God is calling you to. As, as we come to a close, can I, can I ask you this question? We can't go through this content without me saying this question. What, what are you doing with Jesus? Have you said yes to Jesus? Are you following him? Is he the one focus of your life? May this be an opportunity where you can be intentional, maybe take the opportunity to refocus and make sure that you are investing in things that have eternal significance. And as we come to a close, I would, I would just ask that wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, would you just take this opportunity to draw close to him, make sure that your relationship with Jesus is up to date, and just maybe just pause and just say thank you to Jesus because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He offers us a way to get to the Father. And that love that he has is, is for you. It's for you. And as we come to a close, I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to say yes to Jesus. So wherever you are, would you just be willing to stand with me in this moment? If you're here today and you're realizing for the first time, hey, I need to receive this gift that God has given me. I need to say yes to Jesus because I'm believing right now that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, and I want to say yes. I want to make this as easy as possible. It doesn't have to be difficult. Join us in saying this prayer because it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's say that prayer together and welcome you as a citizen of heaven. Can we pray this prayer together? Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I am saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. And can we give him praise? Can, can we give him glory? Because he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He loves us with an extravagant love. And, and he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, would you please come talk to me? Come talk to someone on our team. We want to celebrate that with you. Next week, we're having baptisms. That is the celebration of changed lives. And there's nothing better than recognizing I am a citizen of heaven. I have chosen to follow Jesus. And it's a great step of obedience that God has called us to take. So listen, if you've said yes to Jesus, you've not yet taken that next step of being baptized, please sign up. Let's celebrate your life being changed by Jesus because it will never be the same again. Before we close by singing this last song, can I just say a word of prayer over you? Would you bow your head and close your eyes just one more time and just take this opportunity to draw close to Jesus? My goal and my hope is that everyone here has, has responded by, by saying yes to Jesus for the first time. Recognizing that Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life, that no one comes to the Father but by him. I just want to ask you again, what are you doing with Jesus? What are you doing with the gifts that he gave you? Are you focusing on running that race and winning that heavenly prize? Just be intentional. Draw close to Jesus. Make sure you're not missing a single opportunity that God has for you because that's where real life is lived. That's where life is lived to the fullest, when we follow him. Jesus, I thank you for all that you have done for us, the love that you have for us, the, the provision that you have given us that is not just for today, not for tomorrow, but for all of eternity. God, we, we just say this to you. We, we are putting our trust in you. We thank you for your extravagant, unending love. We don't deserve it. And God, we just ask that you would give us the strength and the power and the focus to keep pressing on, to, to, to finish this race that you have called us to, to win this heavenly prize that you offer each of us. God, help us to go with your strength, with your power, to, to stay focused, keeping our eyes on you. We love you. We praise you today, and we pray this in your name. Amen.